This is Thursday Night <laughs> Bible Study with Pastor Jillian and Pastor JP. We're pastors at West Covina Hill Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I'm having a hard time uh, not laughing because I am tired out of my mind from a Pathfinder campout that I just got back from yesterday. It was three nights of, of sleeping on the ground in freezing cold temperatures, but it was so worth it. <laughs> if you have a kid between the ages, between the grade, between fifth grade and 10th grade, okay, bring them. The Pathfinder years is, is, is over, but in August, mm -hmm. in August, we'll be starting up again. And um, it, it was a truly amazing weekend, but I am so tired that I'm just a bit silly, okay? So I apologize if I am even more rabbit, rabbit trail-y than usual tonight. Um, I'll try to keep you on track. Thank you. <laughs> That, that's my lead pastor for me. We haven't introduced ourselves. I'm Pastor Jillian. This is Pastor JP. And we are from the West Covina Hills Seventh-day Adventist Church. And we are in the book of 1 Samuel, which has a lot of sleeping on the ground in the wilderness in it. It sure does. It really does. Why don't you pray for us as we get into it? Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit. We ask that the words that would be spoken would reach into our heart, that they would stir something in mm. us that would cause us to see you with more worship, with more love. Mm -hmm. uh, so bless this time, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So last we heard, um, Saul and David were just kind of chasing each other around a mountain, and David was just barely saved because there was a Philistine attack, and um, Saul had to go. So David was able to get away to the strongholds of En Gedi, which is, you know, a very rocky place. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a great place to hide out because there's lots of nooks and crannies, and that's what you want in a hiding place. We are in chapter 24 of 1 Samuel, if you are following along in your Bibles. By the way, the best Bible translation is the one that you read. You may have noticed that sometimes Pastor JP and I are working off of two different translations. Sometimes we match and sometimes we don't. That's because the Bible is the Bible regardless of which translation it is. There's enough information in any Bible to find salvation, which is the whole point. Yep, yep. If you want to, if you want to do more precise study, sure. There, there, I, I have recommendations I can give you and I have strong opinions as to what different translations do well or badly, but the best translation is the one you use. Mm -hmm. It's the one you use. All right. Rabbit trail over. After Saul returned from pursuing the Philistines, he was told, David is in the desert of En Gedi. So Saul took 3,000 chosen men from all Israel and set out to look for David and his men near the crags of the wild goats. A note about translation. I don't get why they translate some place names and not others. Mm -hmm. Is that one translated for you too? Yes. Yeah. Why? It's not even that important. Anyway. <laughs> Wild goats live in very steep, uh, very hilly mountainous regions. It could be portraying to us that they're way up in the, you know, they're up uh, in a very maybe dangerous, maybe a True. steep place. I don't know. I'm it just, just feels like story-wise it would have made more sense to translate uh, Silahamalekoth. From the last chapter, which means, you know, rock of parting, which at least has more to do with the story. Gotcha. Anyway, rant over. Um, he came to the sheep pens along the way. A cave was there, and Saul went in to relieve himself. So, by the way, if you ever do join Pathfinders and take the caving honor, this is a big no-no. Okay, one of the things we teach in Pathfinders, if you ever take the Pathfinder caving honor, is never go to the bathroom in a cave because you're going to mess it up for whoever explores the cave next. Yuck. Unfortunately, for poor David, there already are people inside this very cave. King Saul. For poor King Saul. For poor King Saul. <laughs> for poor King Saul. Saul goes into this cave thinking he has a private place to relieve himself. David and his men were far back in the cave. Mm. They were far back in the cave. The men said, this is the day the Lord spoke of when he said to you, I will give your enemy into your hands for you to deal with as you wish. 
So the men are all like, hey, King Saul's in here and he's totally vulnerable. In order for them to have this conversation, I imagine that it was number two, not number one. Okay, for them to have time to have this conversation. Um, which is just such a very vulnerable thing. Um, and then David crept up unnoticed and cut off a corner of Saul's robe. Now, before we record, we always have a conversation as to uh, who wants what chapter. I wanted this chapter for this reason, okay? Yeah, sure, I love caves, and that's a part of, that's part of the allure here. But the real reason why I wanted this was because I learned something today about what the hem of the robe signified, mm. okay? Going back again to Pathfinders or to military, your ranks will be on your sleeve, you know, whatever. Um, there's different chevrons that show how many years you've been in things, all that good stuff. Some branches of the military have um, pins on the collar that, that reveal rank. Um, so we're familiar with, with clothing demonstrating rank. But um, in Bible times, <coughs> the part that they decorated to show rank was the hem of the robe. Mm. I always used to wonder, so what did it matter if he cut off the hem of the robe? Doesn't everyone have like the same sort of cloth here? No. It turns out that the hem of the robe... Um, I don't know why I'm gesturing at the hem of my dress because you can't see it on camera. Uh, <laughs> she is doing it, I promise. But it turns out that the decorations on the hem of the robe were what showed rank, that mm -hmm. this is Saul's robe. That if you want to capture one piece of clothing, um, it would be to take a swatch of his robe because his robe would be the only one with the kingly hem on it. And as I was listening to this, I was like, oh, this makes so much sense because... In Exodus, it takes a long time to describe how to do the hem of the priest's robes. And I always yeah. thought that was kind of weird. But if that's where they saw rank is coming from, of course you want a very distinctive hem for very distinctive things. Very interesting. Um, yeah, I, I, I thought so. And when David is cutting off a corner of Saul's robe, it's not just a sign of disrespect. It, it, it's not just that he's getting proof that he was that close, Okay. It's also a symbolic way of disrespecting Saul's kingship because the hem of the robe is where Saul is wearing his rank. He's not wearing a crown. There's no reason for him to wear a crown all the way out in the middle of nowhere. Most kings, presidents, don't wear whatever their fancy ceremonial stuff is when they're out at war, okay? Um, they wear whatever the military insignia mm -hmm. is, which in this case would be whatever decorations are on the hem of his robe, because that's a practical way of showing rank, whereas wearing a heavy crown everywhere you go is not practical. It's just not. It's mm -hmm. just not. Um, if you look at, if you look at um, portraits of various kings in Europe um, who are at war, they're usually wearing their country's military rankings, you know, right. all of their psh, whatever, their medals, whatever. Mm -hmm. Goya's are kind of my favorites. Um, he, he has a way of both, uh, both beautifying and mocking his subjects at the same, at the exact same time. Um, but what David's doing here is he's stripping Saul of his rank. He sure is. And he's doing it while the king is vulnerable. This is unusually aggressive for David. I get the sense that maybe he's feeling the pressure of his men that, who are sick of being on the run and that um, he's bowing to their wishes and maybe he's sick of being on the run. It is, after all, a desolate place out there. And while I love caves, I wouldn't want to live in one for, for an extended period of time, especially in the ancient world where um, all of your lighting comes from burning something, and there's no ventilation in there. In your house, you might have some ventilation, some windows, whatever, but you have no ventilation in a cave. Smell like smoke all the time. All the time. All the time. Could I add one more note here? Mm -hmm. um, in verse 4, when the men say to him, This is the day which the Lord said to you, I will deliver him into your hand. There's actually mm -hmm. no place in the Bible where God said that to David. Mm -hmm. Now, it doesn't mean, because not everything... God is doesn't even identify us. Saul as an enemy. No, he does not. That is absolutely correct. So, 
it's the men putting words into God's into mouth. God's mouth for David, which mm-hmm. maybe pushes him in a direction that David wouldn't normally go into mm-hmm. by a misquote. Last episode, I mentioned my pastor buddies. Most of the time, we're healthy for each other. But every once in a while, we push each other to do things that normally we wouldn't and probably shouldn't do. You know, that's that's the power of friendship cuts both ways. It, it, it can both make you stronger sure. or it can make you stupid. Um, and ironically enough, ironically enough, the, the, the same people who are healthy for you can in certain situations be unhealthy for you. I'm not saying that my pastor friends are bad people. I'm just saying that 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 some people love drama and occasionally that 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 influences the way they advise me. I love them anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but we don't just have to look out for who we get advice from, but we have to look out for the content of that advice and weigh for whether or not it's true. Um, Confucius said it very well when when he said, "Never discount advice entirely because of who said it." nor discount someone entirely because of one thing they said. I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but not by much. Um, Everything needs to be weighed on its own merits. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So David does this thing. He basically strips Saul of his rank. He could have killed Saul, which would have been worse. His men probably wanted him to kill him. So maybe, maybe David's just appeasing them and being all like, okay... I'm just gonna take his insignia as a way to go, neener, 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 and um, show my men that, I, uh, that I'm that i taking their, their wandering around the wilderness seriously. But afterward, in verse 5, this says to me a lot about David. David was conscience-stricken for having cut off a corner of his robe. He is conscience-stricken. David has a conscience about this. He sure does. He realizes that it's not just a childish prank Mm -hmm. that he just did. He said to his men, The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is the anointed of the Lord. Is he really still the anointed of the Lord? (laughs) I mean... He is anointed. uh, David still sees him that way. But hasn't the Lord withdrawn himself from Saul and anointed another? Does that, you know, I, 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 maybe it's a technicality. But David maybe is seeing it in an overly positive way at the highest level of respect when maybe it's not quite there anymore? I think that David is getting a flash forward to his own future. Sure. Because David is the Lord's anointed. Saul has been anointed. And um, if David sets a precedent Mm -hmm. that it's okay to take a throne by force, his entire line is going to have a bad time. Okay? There's some stronger words I could use for that, but um, this isn't that kind of, this isn't that kind of YouTube show. Yeah. Um, David doesn't want to get the people in the habit of rebelling against authority. Okay, because he knows that God's going to make him king someday. Mm -hmm. He knows that anything that he does to the sitting king could come back upon him. And we'll get there. It really does a dozen fold. It's 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 kind of nuts what happens to poor David within his own kingship. Mm -hmm. Um, With these words, David rebuked his men and did not allow them to attack Saul. And Saul left the cave and went his way, entirely unaware of the whole incident. I wonder if David just saw his father-in-law there, vulnerable, in the dark, and realized, someday this is going to be me. Someday this is going to be me. What would I want, even the Lord's anointed, who's in the background, to do to me? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so maybe he just really cared about Saul too. Yeah, yeah. And just because Saul was mad at him didn't mean that he didn't have still feelings for Saul, who gave him a place in the army, gave him a place in his his court, gave him his daughter. So Mm -hmm. maybe there's still just feelings there, and Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, we all have mentors, and there, there's this awkward, there's this awkward time when we get old enough to realize that our mentors are human and do stupid things. Um, <laughs> but you never lose your affection for them, okay? Mm -hmm. um, even if they really did do some dumb things, you, you you can't lift your hand against them because you never forget what they did for you. Yeah. Even if they also did some really bad stuff too. So then David went out of the cave. This is so brave. David doesn't even have to let Saul know that he was ever mm -hmm. there. David could David could have first killed Saul in the cave. Second, he could have totally just um, faded into the background and let Saul and waited out Saul's men until they left. But David does the risky thing that steps toward reconciliation. He takes the steps, the brave, the courageous steps towards bridging the gap. I don't think that he was within spear throwing distance. Saul was just a little farther away. <laughs> I'm just saying, I'm just saying, when he came out to talk to him, he let a little distance get between himself and Saul before he came out mm -hmm. of the cave. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> da da David is brave, not stupid. <laughs> <laughs> then David went out of the cave and called out to Saul, my lord, the king. When Saul looked behind him, David bowed down and prostrated himself with his face to the ground. He mm. shows deep respect. Deep respect. He said, to, which by the way is also risk, because Saul could have ordered his men to basically shoot David in the back while bowing. Okay, sure. You know? He said to Saul, why do you listen when men say, David is bent on harming you? This day you have seen with your own eyes how the Lord delivered you into my hands in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you. I said, I will not lift my hand against my master because he is the Lord's anointed. See, my father, look at this piece of your robe in my hand. I cut off the corner of your robe, but did not kill you. Now understand and recognize that I am not guilty of wrongdoing or rebellion. Mm. He, he's keeping the moral high ground. If, if, if he had just killed Saul... Um, it would have been, it really would have been a rebellion. He, he, this way he keeps the moral high ground and leaves vengeance in God's hands. I have not wronged you, but you are hunting me down to take my life. May the Lord judge between you and me, and may the Lord avenge the wrongs you have done to me, but my hand will not touch you. As the old saying goes, from evildoers come evil deeds. So my hand will not touch you. Now, what's interesting about this speech is by identifying harming the king as an evil deed, he's keeping his own men from going rogue yeah. and killing Saul on his behalf. Yeah. You know, history is littered, just littered um, mm -hmm. with people who, who kept their own hands clean but did their dirty work through other people. But here David is even forbidding his own men from harming Saul. Mm -hmm. When Saul eventually dies... It's not by any by anything by David. It's not even from David's men. It's not even from the Philistines. Saul just will get there. Um, but David, even though he's been chased by this man, persecuted by this man, yeah. cheated by this man, harmed and wronged by this man, he's protecting him. Um, it's incredible. Jesus talks about loving your enemies and here mm -hmm. David is revealing that idea portrayed in real life because sometimes mm -hmm. we wrestle to understand how can I love my enemies and David by the way is a man who's not squeamish about killing people there's nothing about about laying a sword on someone that makes makes David squeamish physically this is because he realizes that Saul mm -hmm. really is the Lord's anointed. Mm -hmm. This is to protect Saul specifically because he realizes that there's nothing Saul can really do to harm him permanently. You yeah. know? Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom are you pursuing? A dead dog? A flea? 
May the Lord be our judge and decide between us. May he consider my cause and uphold it. May he vindicate me by delivering me from your hand. I love this next part. When David finished saying this, Saul asked, Is that your voice, David, my son? And he wept aloud. The commentator I was listening to didn't buy the emotional authenticity of this moment, but I do. I believe it's possible for someone to feel penitent. Mm -hmm. um, and even if they go back on it later on, I, I believe that the emotion here is genuine. Um, and that he realizes the enormity of what David just did. It seems to me that um, his... Uh that that just the coming out and expressing these words mm -hmm. you know david is revealing something of his own heart but it mm -hmm. is also embarrassing to saul right yeah. um paul talks about loving your enemies by pouring out kindness on them this act of kindness and sparing his life is the total opposite of the way that saul is mm -hmm. so that oppositeness really hits him right it mm -hmm. uh it wakes him up. It slaps him in the face. Well, and the whole business with the robe makes more sense now because in a way, in this moment, by showing Saul mercy, this is where the transfer of the kingship really happens. Mm -hmm. um, David is holding up the sign of the kingship, the field sign of the kingship, and saying, I have no interest in killing you. Mm -hmm. I shouldn't have even done this, but here's proof. Yeah. But Saul looks at that and realizes... For David, taking off the king's insignia isn't the moment of transfer, but for Saul, it very much is. This is the moment where Saul finally realizes that David is the future. You are more righteous than I, he said. Mm. Which is, by the way, a, a, a sentence that has echoes in the book of Genesis. I won't get into it now because that's a very long rabbit trail. Mm -hmm. You have treated me well, but I have treated you badly. You have just now told me of the good you did to me. The Lord delivered me into your hands, but you did not kill me. When a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away unharmed? <laughs> no. May the Lord reward you well for the way you treated me today. I know that you will surely be king. He's seeing David with the insignia there. I know that you will surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hands. Now swear to me by the Lord that you will not cut off my descendants or wipe out my name from my father's family. In, Jude, in, in old school Judaism, you know, okay, let me first say Judaism is not a monolith. You have two Jews, you have three opinions. But <laughs> a large strain of Jewish thought is that the worst per thing to happen to you isn't, isn't death. Okay, it's being forgotten. Mm. It's it, um, the Jewish views on the afterlife vary dramatically. Um, some say there is one, some say there isn't one. It's really not the most important question to them. I think it's possible to be Jewish and Adventist at the same time without many contradictions. Sure. Because the one is, a fulfill is in many ways a fulfillment of the other. Um, but the biggest deal thing is you don't want to be forgotten. And there are ways that in the ancient Near East in particular, incoming kings would do everything they could to forget to, and make the people forget what came before. Moses, um, Joseph's name was stricken from the history books of Pharaoh, which is how the Israelites were in slavery for 400 years. This is something that happened a lot, was that incoming dynasties would, would straight up chisel off statues, blot out names, um, destroy the records of what came before um, so the people wouldn't know that anyone else had ever been in charge before with a different perspective. So Saul here is almost pathetically asking, okay, you win, David. Just make sure I'm not forgotten. Mm. Don't let me be forgotten. So David gave his oath to Saul. Then Saul returned home. This also is amazing because now that David's exposed himself, Saul could kill him. Saul could choose this moment to dig in and have another one of his, his um, 
manic rages, but instead he surrenders. Um, Saul returns home, but David and his men went up to the stronghold. They, they realize that things aren't comfortable enough for them to have David return to court or anything like that. That's too volatile. And while there's things that you can work out in the field between leaders and between your men, there are certain realities that you just can't do in the urban city center. Um, so David just goes back into the wilderness to keep biding his time, but he can finally breathe a bit because he's no longer being chased. For a minute. For a minute, anyway. And Saul can go home and do his job because he's no longer so hung up on catching David. I feel like if David really felt safe, he wouldn't continue to live in the stronghold, um, in the cave, in the mountain of the goats. Um, right, 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 You know, right. he would have come down if he was like, oh, it's over. Here, let me come down. Let's move in to Judah. Let's, you know, mm-hmm. set up a house. Let's uh, send, the, send the 600 men home. But that's not mm-hmm. really the reality of what's happening here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a truce, but it is very momentary, very fleeting. Yeah, yeah. D- David is still hedging his bets a bit, but he doesn't send his men after Saul, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, there's certainly irreconcilable differences here, but they at least come to an impasse. They come to a ceasefire, at least for a moment. Mm-hmm. And that's beautiful. One of my favorite Christmas stories of all time happened during World War I. The Germans and the British were fighting each other. Bloody, bloody war, trench warfare. In some ways, I, I would say that World War I is quite possibly the most uselessly um, violent and wasteful war. It's quite possibly the most wasteful war in human history. Mm. Um, because so many men died just to move borders by a couple of feet in, in either direction. Yeah, trenches. And most of the men fighting that war didn't even want to be there. So Christmas comes around, and there's this brutal war going on. And... <laughs> Someone starts singing on one side, Stille Nacht, alle Nacht, alle Schleifeisen wacht. On the other side, Silent Night, Holy Night. They put down their arms. They enter into no man's land. And for the as long as Christmas lasts, they share their provisions. They sing Christmas carols together across the language barrier. A lot of these these countries they have shared Christmas carols in different languages. Mm-hmm. You know, Stilla Nacht slash Silent Night being one of them. Um, and they 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 exchange food. They laugh. They. They celebrate Christmas. They ignore their general's orders and they just... The next day, it's sad. They pick up their machine their, their machine guns and they go back to killing each other. But there's this brief moment, this brief beautiful moment where they resist the pressures of the yeah. situation enough to see each other as human beings mm-hmm. and to have this ceasefire. It's beautiful. To recognize each other as human. And this is what Saul and David are doing here. Um, that story is often told about the beauty of Christmas and the, 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 the magic of Christmas and blah, 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 blah. But in many ways, it is an act of resistance against the situations that try to make people enemies. Mm-hmm. Saul and David, everything is pressuring them to be enemies. The, the, the outgoing king, the incoming king. It's, it's a messy situation. But for this moment... Even though they'll go back to some cat and mouse stuff later on, for this moment, they acknowledge each other as human, make peace, and acknowledge each other's humanity. Awesome. The world needs more moments like these, even if they don't last very long. Um, they, it, it needs more pauses for humanity and for shared beauty. even when situations just sort of conspire to go against it. So, I, you know, I don't know what situations you're dealing with, but let's definitely pray for more of these moments of shared humanity and beauty. Lord God, there's so much conspiring to make us enemies with people around us. 
but you designed us all to be one in you. I pray, Lord, that even where situations make people, you know, natural or situational rivals, that you you give us moments of humanity and that as much as it's up to us, you make us the peacemakers who make those possible, that you make us the ones to de-escalate the tensions in the room, Mm. that where, where there is hatred, let us sow love, where there is darkness, let us sow light, and where there is sadness, let us sow joy. You are so very good to us and let us never forget it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.